Hey everyone, now that I've made three videos about attachment and the different types of attachment, I kind of want you to forget everything I said. Because the worst thing that can happen is that you start going around trying to simply reduce everyone to being avoidant, ambivalent, or secure or whatever. And it's just not that simple. People have different types of attachment styles with different people, I think. And really, the most important thing for you to remember is the impact of stress on the brain. Because that's really how you're going to learn to track how stressed out a person is and possibly understand how to de-escalate a person. For me to explain what I mean by how to track a person's state of mind, I think it makes sense to talk about adult attachment. And so one of Mary Ainsworth's students, Mary Main, wanted to understand whether or not she could study attachment behaviors in adults. And so Mary Main thought, well, maybe I can just ask people about what their childhoods were like. And maybe if they've had bad childhoods, then they're more likely to have insecure attachments. And if they've had good childhoods, then they're going to be more secure. So she created this whole attachment interview, and it was questions like, how would you describe your family, describe each parent, were there ever any times in your life whenever you felt really scared and what did you do about it, how did your parents respond, and all kinds of other questions. And unfortunately, she didn't find that bad childhoods predicted insecure attachments. What I like to believe is that Mary Main couldn't figure out what to do with her interviews, and she happened to be in San Francisco, and there was this guy at Berkeley named Grice, and he was a philosopher of linguistics. And he had come up with these four maxims or rules about how conversations need to go. The actual term for them are what, let me say, quantity, quality, relation, and manner. And what that means is that you try to give good information, you try to be truthful, you try to be brief, and you try to be relevant. And so she started to code these interviews on how much they violated or stuck with Grice's maxims. And this is where it gets really interesting. She found that secure people have great conversations with you. If you're the interviewer of a secure person, you actually really enjoy those conversations because they're engaging, they tell you the truth, and they fill in their childhood memories with stories that are vivid. And then what she found was that avoidant people would do what you think they would do. They wouldn't necessarily give you a lot of information. They wouldn't be very truthful or they'd be very vague and give you cliches. And their interviews would be very brief and full of like a lot of just like, eh, not really interesting material. And then the ambivalent person also gave really interesting answers. Now, these people would do all kinds of violations of conversation. They would um, say too much. They would uh, go off topic. They would digress. They would actually have violations of verb tense so that when you ask them about past experiences, they end up talking about present or recent past experiences. And then the interviewer just is like, what are you talking about? You're not answering the question. You're drifting off into all these tangents. And these interviews also go on for a very long time, like maybe one and a half times the regular length of an interview whereas the avoidant conversation goes really short. And so the way I understand what's happening is that the mind of the person actually gets altered whenever they're talking about their childhood. So a secure person, when they're talking about the childhood, it doesn't stress them out. And so they can stay present about what's going on and realize that this is a conversation between two people and they try to give good, meaningful information. Now, the avoidant person, whenever they start talking about childhood, their brains want to numb out like they used to do whenever they're in pain. And so they can't access a lot of good information, and they don't really have the kind of emotional words that they can use to make a story rich and vivacious. And then the ambivalent person gets really stressed out talking about childhood. Because once they start talking about their parents, that yearning for attachment and security gets triggered. It's like psychologically, they want to reach out for their moms to be consoling when they're stressed, but then they also get scared of that. And so their brains get disorganized, they start running around in circles, they become circuitous, and they talk too much, and they are totally absent from the conversation. So this is the thing that I really want you to be aware of. The way that you can tell a person is really stressed out could be that all of a sudden they start giving shorter answers, they seem numb, they say that they don't feel anything, or on the other hand, it could be that they're talking too much and their answers just don't make sense, they keep going off on tangents or digressions, and you get really confused about what they're saying. In future videos, we will talk about how to help people calm down from that. After this video, I just want you to pay attention to how your own brain operates whenever you get stressed and start paying attention to how the people around you start to talk whenever they get really stressed.